Thanks very much, Professor. Um, right, I'm going to talk to you about some of the work that we've been doing down south in Stellenbosch. And uh, this is obviously more than one person involved. And we're going to talk about so-called enhanced podcasts. Now, you all know that podcasts are really just audio that you can download and listen to on an iPod or whatever. Uh, it might be a laptop or pretty much anything. But enhanced podcasts are audio plus some sort of visual aid. And the visual aid that we are using is the recorded PowerPoint slideshow off the screen. And that gets combined with the audio and produces a so-called enhanced podcast or video podcast or screencast are also some of the terms that are used for this. Right, so why did we do it? Um, we really were aiming to measure how the students use podcasts, whether they found it useful at all, um, did it affect their learning, and then finally, how could we improve on what we were doing. Just a little bit on the infrastructure that we've been using. The core of what we've got is a thing called Camtasia Relay, which you see in the uh, top right hand of your screen there. That sits on a server centrally uh, at the university and it crunches the audio combines the screen PowerPoint slideshow and produces a little video. But sitting out in the periphery are, uh, on all the PCs in the lecture halls is the Camtasia Relay client. And um, that client is free. The server version is not. The client comes, as it were, with a server. And um, it needs to be online on a network in order to communicate with the server and produce uh, a video. So once the server spits out an MP4 file, goes along for a little bit of processing, not much. All we do is sort of shave the student noise when they come into the classroom off the front, the noise at the end when the lecture is finished, put on a, um, a title, and a copyright and then send it up to the content management system which is a website. So the whole procedure takes about one to two hours after completion of the lecture. Uh, as I mentioned the lecture is recorded, sent to the server, returned for editing, placed on the content management. Very simple workflow um, and this is done or managed just by one individual. This entire process. So it's not all that labor intensive. What was labor intensive was actually finding folks to press the buttons. When the lecturer walks into the hall, um, how do we go about getting the podcasts recorded? Now, in a particular lecture block, uh, six-week lecture block, there could be something like 80 lectures and a approximately 35 to 40 different lecturers uh, involved in that six-week lecture block. So getting hold of the lecturers and trying to teach them to pre press the buttons was, we just decided we we're not going there. So we got ourselves a team of students, right? We said to them, two of you are for Monday, two of you for Tuesday, right throughout the week. You make sure if one of you isn't there on the Monday, you phone your mate and they press the buttons for Monday. And so when the lecturer walked into the hall, the students pressed the buttons, started everything going, made sure that there was audio coming off the uh, lecturer's wireless mic, made sure that the video was being captured. When the lecturer finished, the lecturer walked out, the student stopped the recording, gave it a name, the name of the lecture, and off it went to get processed and that works fantastically. Part of the reason is that the students need these podcasts so they are extremely motivated to make sure that they get recorded. 
Right, then end of the project, we did a, a survey. We've got roughly one and a half thousand medical students at our faculty. And we managed to get in the green about a 40% response on our online survey. And I'm going to address these issues, um, which are what the students responded on. How important was the podcasts to them? What did they use them for? Did it influence their marks? What other resources are they using for learning? And a very interesting aspect, um, auditory learning as opposed to uh, visual or uh, what was the other type um, where you use motor skills to learn. Mobile learning and finally everyone wants to know, in fact all the lecturers want to know, what is the effect going to be on my lecture attendance if the students can download my lecture beforehand? Aha, uh -huh, so that was important. So, on the importance of podcasts, and this is a, a quote from one of the students. They said, extremely useful. Like I said, you can download it here for free on campus. Put it on your memory stick and go home and watch it. It's free of charge, and in your own time you can sit and listen to it. And 77% of our entire student cohort said, yep, it really helps them learn. How much it helps them learn varies from year to year. Um, and we've got first year through to fourth year. We've combined the fifth and sixth years because that's the so-called clinical year or clinical years. It's actually one and a half years when they get into the hospital, they get out into the clinics and they start doing practical patient-to-patient uh, -patient contact. And you can see that the podcasts were almost always in blue, helpful for first, second, third, and fourth years, less so when they get into their clinical years when they're in patient contact. But if you have a closer look at what the clinical students say, the ones in their fifth and sixth years, is that they enjoy using them as well. The one felt almost a bit guilty that they could download the lecturer's podcast and know what that lecturer was going to ask them when they got on a ward round. So they found that very helpful. And of course they could put them on their uh, mobile device, carry it around the ward with them and listen to it wherever they were. And some more quotes from students. The SI year is the so-called student intern year, which is their sixth year. And they're exclusively in the hospital in their sixth year. And again, when they have a few minutes and they have a tough question, they can go and look at a podcast. What was interesting is that this group of students who responded did not have the podcasts available when they went through most of their theory blocks. So this was brand new to them, yet in that second paragraph uh, they'd go back, they'd download somebody else's podcasts and found it also extremely useful. So what other sort of uses did they get out of these podcasts, enhanced podcasts? And here they could answer more than one category. Most of them clarifying concepts not fully grasped in class. Now, these poor students, I don't want to be a student again, but they sit for sometimes six hours a day, uh, three quarters of an hour lecture each, or six times a day, three quarters of an hour lecture each. And you can imagine, uh, if you've done a hard night studying, or partying, <laughs> if you're a student, um, the next morning is not that clear when it comes to three, four o'clock in the afternoon and you're not quite keeping up with the lecturer when it comes to physiology or complex disease processes. So that was the major role, clarifying concepts, not fully grasped in class. Revision before an exam, 
catching up on lectures that they missed. And this was a variety of uh, reasons that they couldn't get there. Some of them said, well, I battle through traffic and I can't make the first lecture. So I always miss the first lecture, but I get there in time for the second lecture. And then I catch up on the podcast of the first lecture. Or I'm ill, classic. Uh, or I'm just too lazy. And I'll show you some of those that were just too lazy. But there was a very interesting um, student who won a scholarship to take an international trip, a cruise around the world on a ship. And she passed her second year by getting into the port, plugging in her PC, downloading all the lectures, and studying them while she was bobbing around on the ocean. So she managed to do that uh, while seeing the world, which I thought was quite amazing. <laughs> Preparing for the exams, and then finally, uh, some of our students, the first language or second language is, uh, first language is not either English or Afrikaans, and they then want to slow the podcast down, stop it, look up some, something in a dictionary, and they found that assisting with language was really important for them. Just to reinforce what I said earlier, mostly for lectures I didn't understand the first time around. You sit in class, you're tired, uh, just to have them in the background. So students would listen to them um, and say, ooh, maybe I missed that. Let me quickly make a note of it. This last paragraph I found a bit disturbing. About two weeks before the exams, I downloaded everything. I listened to everything at double the speed. That's how I studied. <laughs> That's not the reason for us putting podcasts there, so that you can actually uh, skim through everything with a bit of surface learning. Anyhow. So the next aspect, what influence did the students think that it had on their marks? And I drew that big red line at, at 80%. And you can see that more than 80% mostly in the first, second, and third year agreed or strongly agreed that it had positively influenced their marks, having these podcasts to fall back on, to revise, and to go over concepts with. It got less in their fourth year, just under 80%. And in the fifth and sixth year, it was around about 70%, despite that group not having the uh, podcasts available when they did their theory blocks. Again, some quotes from students. Uh, one individual said it helped a lot, especially going over things I wasn't completely sure about. And then some group learning going on in the next paragraph. My friend and I used the podcasts a lot. We'd come back, go over the podcast, uh, and it helped a lot in our studying, and we could see a reflection in the marks. Now, we couldn't really correlate a change in the marks. So this is just a student's perception, um, and in fact, the majority of students' perception that it has benefited them in their studies. But if you look at the, the actual marks that they get, there's not much difference. OK, what other types of resources were they using besides the podcasts? And there's an interesting shift. From first and second year, they're using a lot of class handouts uh, in the uh, orange, relying on the lecturer giving them uh, notes, which are pre-printed. And then also the lecturer's PowerPoint slides. They are so keen in the first two years at least to get the lecturer's slides and then write little notes next to them. That profile changes and as you get to fifth and sixth year you can see that they're using far more textbooks. Whereas in the first and second year textbooks were a minute amount. Um, and also in the fifth and sixth year the internet use, they go online, they check what's happening, they look at evidence-based resources, and they are becoming far more mature students. 
what was interesting was some of the emphasis on rediscovering auditory learning. Um, and you know the, the difference between you're either a visual, auditory, or a kinesthetic, was the word I was looking for earlier on, learner. And you're not necessarily categorized as that permanently. You can shift your um, approach to learning. But some of the students actually said, well, wow, I've rediscovered the fact that I can just sit and listen, I can walk around, I can do my nails, said one lady, I can do the cooking, do my chores, and I can just listen to the lecturer in the background. It seems to filter through your brain. <laughs> I like the way they put that. Okay, mobile learning. And although these are little videos, a number of students found it extremely useful because they could put them on their iPad or iPod, go jogging, go on a bus, be on the train. And what was interesting, if they were bored, <laughs> they could listen to it. Um, while doing chores and stuff, as I mentioned. They thought that they learned a bit better when they listened to it over again. Now, the final crunch comes, as it were, on what the uh, lecturer's perspective is. Because they say to, to an e-learning manager like me, well, I'm not too sure I should let you record my lectures, because then my students aren't going to come and attend. Well there was 2% of the students who makes no difference whether you record the lectures or not, they are not going to attend the lectures. That's just the way they do university. They study from books or whatever, but they do not attend lectures. You can be the best lecturer out, 2% of the class will not be there. But interestingly, 6% said they frequently miss lectures because they had the availability of podcasts. And we correlated the um, use, the download of those podcasts with those who said they frequently or always missed the lectures. <coughs> and in fact, these people used the podcasts a lot, more than anybody else, which at least was good news for us. So, two conclusions. Students see podcasts mostly as a sort of a safety net. If they miss a lecture, if they don't understand it properly, they can use the podcasts. Um, and at this stage, we are fortunate to have recorded um, roughly two and a half to 3,000 podcasts from our first year right through to the sixth year, including clinical stuff like how to drain fluid from a lung, how to inject a joint with steroids, yeah, that sort of practical type stuff. And very interestingly, the students also said, this is a good tool for the lecturers because we can check the quality of the lecturer's input. And the lecturers, they suggested, should be checking their own podcasts to see if they can improve them. Now, interestingly enough, if you look at who logs onto the website, not many lecturers. <laughs> so they're not making use of listening to their own podcasts and seeing how they can improve it, unfortunately. So the co further um, conclusions was that the students would like us to expand this capability. They wanted the um, capacity to place comments next to each little podcast, Professor so-and-so, could you please explain X, Y, Z, or dear Dr. Walsh, uh, your podcast is really poor quality, please redo it, <laughs> if that was perhaps what they felt. But they also wanted to be able to give it a star rating. As you see on uh, quite a lot of these video sites, you can click on something and it will give you zero to ten stars. 
So they wanted that, and in our next version of um, our content management system, we will have that available for them. And then I just want to acknowledge funding from the MEPI school, uh, PEPFAR via HRSA and the Medical Education Partnership Initiative, and you can see all our fellow partners and recipients of MEPI grants across Africa, and uh, we enjoy working with them. Thank you.